is a story about who I am and why. It was originally written in June of 2007. Uh, it started out, uh, it was originally, portions of this were originally published on my blog, originally published uh, when I wrote for the Suicide Girls Newswire, and uh, uh, the story appears in its entirety in my book, The Happiest Days of Our Lives. It is called The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Geek. December, 1983. I sat on the floor in my Aunt Belle's house and I opened up her Christmas present to me. It was a red box with a really cool looking dragon on the front of it. Inside there were a few books, some dice, and a map. That's a game that I hear lots of kids like to play, Willow, she said. It's got dragons and wizards and all those things you liked from The Hobbit. The back says you use your imagination, and I know what a great imagination you have. My brother played with Lego, and my cousins played with handheld electronic games. I felt ripped off. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Thanks, Aunt Belle! Later, while the other kids played with Simon and Mattel electronic football, I sat near the fireplace and examined my gift. It said that I could be a wizard, or a fighter, or a class called Elf. <laughs> kids, ask your parents. But there weren't any pieces in the board, in the box, that looked like that. There were a lot of weird dice, and I had to color in the numbers. Okay, well, that seems silly, but at least it's something to do, and it's kind of like playing, I guess. I grabbed the black crayon and rubbed it over the pale blue dice, just like the instructions said. My Aunt Val, who was my favorite relative in the world throughout my entire childhood and all of my adulthood until the day she died, walked into the living room. What do you think, Willow? I, um, colored in these dice. <laughs> but I, I haven't read the book yet. She patted my leg. Well, I hope you like it. She moved to the other side of the room where my cousin Jack played Cement Factory on a Nintendo game and watched, lucky son of a bitch. <laughs> I opened the player's book and I began to read. February, 1984. It was afternoon PE in fifth grade and I was terrified. I ran and jumped and ducked, surrounded by a jeering crowd of my classmates. The PE teacher did nothing to stop the attack. In fact, she encouraged it. Get him! Someone yelled as I fell to the asphalt, small rocks digging into my palms. I breathed hard. Through my adrenaline-fueled flight or fight response, the world slowed. The jeering faded. And I wondered to myself why our playground was just a parking lot and why we had to wear corduroy pants in the middle of a Southern California heat wave. Before I could offer up any answers, a clear and loud voice spoke from my lizard brain. Hey, it said, you better get up and move or you're dead. I nodded my head and I looked up in time to see a red playground ball spinning in slow motion as the word Voight rotated into view. I'm just going to apologize in advance if this gives any of you guys post-traumatic stress flashbacks. <laughs> Friends of Will W. meet on the bow later. Pain exploded across my face and a mighty cheer erupted from the crowd. The PE teacher blew her whistle. I don't know how I managed to be the last kid standing on our dodgeball team. I usually ran right to the front of the court so I could get knocked out quickly and with a minimum of pain before the good players got worked up by the fury of battle and started taking headshots. But I'd been stricken by a bout of temporary insanity, perhaps brought on by the February heat that was held in by my corduroy pants. And I'd actually played to win this stupid game using a very simple strategy, the run like hell and hope to get lucky strategy. I blinked back tears as I looked up at Jimmy Just, who had delivered the fatal blow. Jimmy, a playground bully. He spent as much time in the principal's office as he did in our classroom. He was the most feared dodgeball player at the Lutheran School of the Foothills. He laughed at me, his long hair stuck to his face in sweaty mats, and he sneered, nice try, Will the Pill. I picked myself up off the ground, determined not to cry. I sucked in deep gasps of air through my nose. Mrs. Cooper, the PE teacher, came over to me. Are you okay, Will? She asked. Uh-huh, I lied. Anything more than that, and I risked breaking down into humiliating sobs that would follow me around the rest of the school year, perhaps persisting once we changed campuses at the end of spring and moved to the new campus in sixth grade. 
Why don't you go wash off your face, she said, not unkindly, and sit down for a minute. Okay. I walked slowly across the blacktop to the drinking fountains. Maybe if I really took my time, I could run out the clock, and I wouldn't have to get back in for another stupid dodgeball game. January, 1984. Papers scattered across my bed appeared to be homework to the casual, untrained eye. But to me, each sheet represented a person. A thief, a couple of wizards, a fighter, a party of adventurers who desperately wanted to leave the keep on the borderlands. But without anyone to guide them, they sat alone, trapped in the purgatory of my bedroom, straining behind college-ruled blue lines to be brought into life. I tried to recruit my younger brother to play with me, but he was seven and more interested in Monchichi. The kids in my neighborhood were more interested in football and doing jumps on their bikes. So I was left to read through module B2 myself, wandering the caves of chaos and dodging the lizard men alone. February, 1984. I washed my face and drank deeply from the drinking fountain. By the time I made it back to the benches along the playground's southern edge, I'd lost the urge to cry, but my face radiated enough heat to compete with the blistering La Crescenta sun. I didn't confirm it, but I was fairly certain the word Voigt was written across my cheek backwards. I sat down near Simon Teal, who, thanks to the wonders of alphabetization, ended up with me and Harry Yan, the school's lone Asian kid, on field trips, on fire drills, and in chapel. Simon was taller than all of us. He wore his hair down into his face, and he kept to himself. He was reading an oversized book that sort of looked like a textbook. It was filled with charts and tables. We weren't officially friends, but I knew him well enough to make polite conversation. Hey, I said. Why don't you have to play dodgeball? Asthma, he said. Lucky. <laughs> I hate dodgeball. Everyone hates dodgeball, he said. He thought for a moment and then added, well, except Jimmy Just. <laughs> yeah. I was relieved to hear someone else say out loud what I'm pretty sure all of us have been thinking since fourth grade. Hey, I said, what are you reading? He held up the book and I saw its cover. A giant statue illuminated by torches behind an archway. Two guys were on its head, prying loose one of its jeweled eyes as a group of people stood near the base. One clearly a wizard, another obviously a knight. This is called the player's handbook, he said. You play D&D? I gasped. According to our ultra-religious school, D&D was satanic. <laughs> I looked up for teachers, but none were nearby. A hundred feet away on the playground, another game of dodgeball was underway. I reflexively flinched when I heard the hollow pang of the ball as it skipped off the ground. Honestly, if, if we, any of us ever worked in like, let's say nerds like worked in a bank, right? All somebody has to do is walk in bouncing a dodgeball and be like, take it, take it, it's, take it, it's all yours. Here, no guy back, just put the ball down, go, go. I'm giving myself a wedgie, it's fine, I got it, you're cool. <laughs> I walked over to my kids' elementary school uh, campus when they attended there, and, um, you know, I'm an adult, like, I can take these fucking kids, <laughs> um, but uh, I heard that thing, and I was like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna send a note. <laughs> You're gonna get in trouble if you get caught with that, I said. No, I won't, he said. I just keep the cover turned upside down, they never see it, so... Do you play or not? I have the red box set and a bunch of characters, I said, but I don't have anyone to play with. Oh, that's basic, he said. This is advanced. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh. But if you want, you can come over to my house this weekend and we can play. I could not believe my good luck. With a dodgeball to the face, Fate put me on the bench next to a kid who, over the next few months, helped me take my first tentative steps down the path to geekdom. He had a ton of AD&D books, The Dungeon Master's Guide, which had a truly terrifying freak demon on the cover, which would result in certain expulsion if seen at school. The Monster Manual, which was filled with dragons, and the Fiend Folio which had not only demons and devils, but a harpy and a nymph who had, had an accompanying drawing of a naked woman with boobs. <laughs> 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 
Simon's parents were divorced. He lived with his mom in a huge house in La Cañada. His room was filled with evidence of that custody cold war. Too many toys to count littered the floor and spilled out of his closet. And even though we were surrounded by Atari and Intellivision, G.I. Joe and Transformers, we had D&D &D fever, and the only prescription was more polyhedral dice. <laughs> Though it was just the two of us playing, we crawled through every inch of the Caves of Chaos and explored the Isle of Dread. We spent all our free time at school making new characters, designing dungeons, and unsuccessfully attempting to recruit other kids to play with us. March 1984. My babysitter Gina's older brother was an experienced dungeon master and he let us play in one of his custom-made dungeons. My fighter walked into a room, got trapped behind a portcullis and died when I sprang a trap trying to escape. It didn't even make sense for there to be a portcullis in front of that room anyway. It was 10 by 10. Like, who puts a portcullis in front of a 10 by 10 room and then traps it? There wasn't even any treasure inside. Like, it just should have said, Are you wondering if I'm a gigantic dick? Walk into this room and find out. Signed, the Dungeon Master. Simon and I decided later that it would be okay to just resurrect my fighter for our own adventurers without penalties because Gina's dungeon wasn't canonical in our world. <laughs> June 1984. Simon and I got two other kids to join our group, Robert and his friend David. The four of us were officially declared the nerds by the cool kids at school. We played almost every weekend. I started carrying my dice, a couple of pencils, and a folded up character sheet with me everywhere I went, stored in the pleather Casio calculator case that my father gave me. <laughs> the satanic panic fueled by Jack Chick's dark dungeons and some hard-hitting investigative reporting during sweeps week on the local television news reached our suburban school. I brought a letter home from my school warning our parents about the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons, signed by the principal, very seriously co-signed by the pastor. My parents laughed it off. Roberts did not. He was prohibited from playing Dungeons and Dragons anymore. And since he had brought David into our little group, David left too. Then, right when school was about to get out for summer, the total party kill. Simon's mom was moving them to Indiana. July 1984. With Simon gone and the satanic panic at its peak, I didn't have anyone to play with. My books and character sheets slowly made their way into my closet as Atari began to creep further and further into my life. Somebody had to help the Yar take their revenge. It may as well be me. <laughs> then, for my birthday, which is July 29th, in case anyone is wondering and wants to make plans. <laughs> Aunt Val gave me a book called Lone Wolf. Lone Wolf was like Choose Your Adventure, but you had a character sheet, and you rolled dice for combat, and your character persisted from one book to the next. It wasn't D&D, but it was close enough. 1987, Fall. I was a freshman in high school and gained admittance to a group of geeks via my friend Darren. We played tons of geeky tabletop games together, watched Holy Grail at least once a month, and argued the finer points of sci-fi, like you do. I was finally surrounded by geeks again, only this time I was proud to be among their number. One day sitting in Darren's house and playing Illuminati, I said, hey, did any of you guys ever play D&D? There was a collective snort of derision. What? I said. We play GURPS, one of them said. <laughs> What's GURPS? A knowing look passed among them. Within a few weeks, I started my first Space Old West Magic Humanx campaign. <laughs> Reference for the 12 of you who have survived GURPS. <laughs> June 1992, the Dark Ages. I met and began dating a girl who didn't appreciate gaming at all. 
and thought it was entirely for nerds. But she let me touch her boobs. So I put my games in the closet. <laughs> As it turns out, yes. <laughs> March 1993, rebirth. We broke up. The games came back out of the closet. My space marines still hold a grudge. 1999, after living together for three years, my girlfriend and I moved out of sin and into marriage. I began counting the days until I could introduce her children, who I was raising as if they were my own, to the wonderful world of tabletop gaming. After we'd spent about six years in each other's life, I began gradually to introduce the kids to some of the geekier things I like. By the time Lord of the Rings came out, they were ready to take their first steps down a path that began in a tavern and ended in a dragon's lair. <laughs> February 2004. The boys and I spent a week or so creating characters and discussing rules, building excitement for our adventure. I stayed up way too late each night after the kids went to bed, poring over websites and my rule books, simulating combats and creating NPCs. It was the first time I'd run an adventure since the sinister secret of Salt March in sixth grade, when I scored a total party kill during the first encounter. <laughs> my friends deposed me. I sat at the dining room table and reviewed cleric spells while the Two Towers soundtrack fueled my imagination. My son Ryan, who was 14 at the time, came out of his room and sat down across from me. What are you doing? He asked. Oh, I'm just refreshing my memory. It's been, um, a very long time since I ran a campaign. And, uh, look, I just want, I paused and thought to myself, I want you to think I'm cool. And I want to do something special for you. I want to share something with you that isn't connected to sports so your biological dad can't take it over and force me out of it. Uh, I want you to make... I want to make sure that you guys have a good time, I said. It's really important to me. I am so excited, he said. Me too. He absentmindedly rolled some D20s I'd scattered across the table. Can I roll up an extra character just for fun? Is your homework finished? <laughs> yeah, everything's done, and I worked ahead in biology. Really? He nodded. Dude, that is super responsible. I'm proud of you. He smiled. So can I? Sure, I said. The dice bags are on my desk. He walked over to my office. My desk, normally buried under computer books and writing journals, was covered with gaming books. Uh, gaming books. All the GURPS books, Mutant Masterminds, Car Wars, tons of cheap-ass games, and of course a stack of D&D &D books that reached to the ceiling. <laughs> it's 4D6, right? He called out. Yep, it's 4D6 and you throw away the lowest roll, we said it in unison. Ryan, I... I love it when that happens. I have an extra character sheet here that you can use. Okay. I went back to my books. A moment later, four six-sided dice dropped from Ryan's hand and rolled across the table. Okay, you're the DM, he said, so you have to watch my rolls. All right, I said. This is something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. This is really fun, I said. He picked up the dice and he threw them. Two, four, five, one. Oh, yeah. Eleven? Oh man, he said. Eleven isn't a bad role, I said. It can inspire role playing. I noticed something familiar about the dice. Two of them were black. They had red numbers. There was a skull where the one should be. Hey, I have dice just like those in. <clears throat> my heart stopped. I ran to my office. There it was in the cool blue glow of my monitor, sitting on top of a D&D &D book, an open bag of not just dice, my dice. <laughs> my bag of my dice. The black bag that my dice live in with the red pyramid from the Bavarian Illuminati on it. A clear D10 and two brilliant blue D12 sat near its open top. Its drawstring was cast carelessly across the side of the book, dangerously close to getting wet in my little zen fountain. Ryan slowly walked into the room. Is, uh, something wrong? He said. <laughs> he 
hit it. <laughs> you touched my dice. <clears throat> well, yeah. Ryan, you don't understand. You are about to see your stepdad as the gamer geek he really is. The gamer geek he hopes you will become one day. You know, this is, this is actually kind of cool. Okay, so you can't touch my dice, I said. Um, aren't they all... He held up his fingers and made quote marks. Your dice? Technically, yes, but these here, in this bag, these ones here are the ones I've played with since I was in high school. He furrowed his brow and looked at me while I put my dice back into my bag. A white D8 with worn off blue numbers, a clear D10 with white numbers, a green D6 that's really a poker die. Does anyone have an actual matched set of dice that they've had since they were in high school? Because if I ever meet that person, I will not trust him or her. <laughs> Ryan, when I was younger, these dice were, these dice were some of the most important things in my life. It's funny how things change. These dice were a really big part of my life, I said. I held the bag in my hand and I looked at him. For the first time in the eight years we had been in each other's lives, I saw some of myself reflected back. You know what? It's not that big a deal, I said. I'd just rather you used some other dice, I said. Like these. <laughs> So, uh, can I re-roll that 11 since I used the forbidden dice? <laughs> you laugh. 11's a good roll, Ryan. I know, but 12 gets me plus one. Okay, all right. All right, min-maxer. Re-roll. <laughs> but if you get a lower roll, you have to keep it. I tossed him my green bag of dice that anybody can touch. <laughs> He dug out four of them. We walked back into the dining room and sat back down at the table. Ryan threw two, five, two, one. Ha! Nine! Aw, oh, man! I bet that 11's looking pretty good now, isn't it? Shut up! He laughed. He collected the dice, held them thoughtfully for a second, and said, I'm sorry I used your dice. I just thought that the bag was so cool. It's okay, Ryan. Someday... Someday I'm going to give you that bag of dice and all the dice in it, and my dice will be your dice. That actually happened when he graduated from college. He gave him my dice. There are two times in my life that Ryan has made me cry. I mean, really cry. When he was 19, he was home visiting from college, and he said to me, um, uh, he said to me, I, um, I've been thinking, I really am the person I am because uh, you raised me and you've basically been a dad to me my entire life, so I was wondering if you would want to maybe adopt me. That's the first time Ryan made me cry. I said yes, by the way. The second time Ryan made me cry. Um, was when I saw him graduate from college, which he just did back in December. And I stood in a Mexican restaurant in Tucson, Arizona and gave him my dice and I cried a third time. <laughs> Someday, I said, you'll have your own dice and your own dice bag and you will understand. He rolled again. Six, six, four, four, 16! Oh on an index card, I wrote a one and a six beneath his nine. Ryan, um, I... I love you more than you will ever know. And I'm really grateful that we share these moments together. I can't wait to play with you guys tomorrow night. June 2007. As much as I want to, I can't really hate dodgeball or those cool kids who tormented me throughout the years because without them, 
I would not have discovered gaming. And no single thing contributes as much to my geekiness or brings me as much joy. I still flinch when I hear the hollow pang of a dodgeball, though. That is a saving throw I will always fail. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. God, I was so scared to read that because it's long and it's not especially funny. But... Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go get my water now. Thank you. Sincerely, really. Okay. I spent a lot of time being afraid and feeling sick to my stomach backstage for not a lot, I guess. 